afternoon, everybody. Did you all have a good lunch? <coughs> yeah? Yeah? Right. Welcome to this special version of college tour called Yonkon Tour. Also special because normally it takes 50 minutes and this session will take 90 minutes. Be prepared! Or as long as it must be. My name is Peter Kerkhoff and I'll be performing Twan Huis this afternoon. <laughs> Your apostolic college tour host. But be sure, I won't make a career as a performer, so you won't see me at RTL Night, because I'm not such a good dancer like uh, Umberto. <laughs> We all know him. Yeah. I'm together here with Sebastian Dembak, he is behind. Together with Sebastian, we will have a conversation with a special guest. Not so sp she is a very special lady, but she's not a surprise anymore, because we all saw her this morning. And Sebastian will give all of you the opportunity to ask questions or to respond to the conversation I will have with our special guest. And she's special, not only because she's a mother, and we heard also this morning, since two weeks, she is a grandmother. She's also married with Marcelina van Furt. That's also special. I saw that. She's also a daughter of a beautiful man, most of you know, Bish uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And she wrote with her father a beautiful book, a book about forgiveness and about reconciliation. We are honored and thrilled to have her here today again, Mrs. Tutu. Please give her a warm applause. <laughs> to wave my magic wand so you still have your South African on, huh? <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. This is our audience. They will listen to us and we give them the opportunity to ask questions. Shall we start? Yeah. Take a seat. Thank you. So, we met before you and you allowed me to say my paw. I did. Some people say my foe. But That's wrong. That's wrong, <laughs> yes. But it's difficult for us to use, uh, to, to pronounce your name correctly. Can you help us? How do you pronounce it correctly? Okay, say, mmm, like very nice. Mm. Can you do it? <laughs> mm. Paw. Paw. Mm, paw. Done. Mm, paw. Okay. Mm, paw. <laughs> are you surprised that all these youngsters over here are so enthusiastic about you? Are you surprised? I think I'm... Well, about me, yeah, I think the youngsters are enthusiastic, and that is a wonderful thing, yes. Yeah. <laughs> they are enthusiastic because they are young. Yes. <laughs> they also get enthusiastic when they're older, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are some older ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and enthusiastic too, yeah. Oh, Yeah, so uh, your earrings. Wait, sorry, this is what comes of wearing 60 million. <laughs> 60 million earrings. Oh, okay, no. You're so flexible. Let's see. Let yeah, great. Okay. okay. Yeah. You're here for uh, about two years in the Netherlands. A year and a half. Year and a half? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you love about the Netherlands? I love my bicycle. Oh. I love my wife. <laughs> Um, I love that it is sane. I love that it is safe. I love that it is well organized. Yeah. And you can say that because you can compare it to other countries where you have yes, been. Yeah. This is true, yes. Yeah. What is it like to be a grandmother since two weeks? Uh, my mother said if I had known that it was so much fun to have grandchildren, I would have had them first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and how does that change your life? Oh, actually, it changes my life because I see my daughter becoming so much more grounded, so much more responsible, so much more there is somebody in the world who I have to take care of who is not me. And that is, yeah, that's, it's an unbelievable transformation. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. It also sounds a little bit like there's already a bridge between your grandchild and you. Even though it is a here, it's a, yeah, it's he's in South Africa. He's in South Africa, yes. But I was, I was, um, I was in South Africa when he was born. Um, so I got to meet him very soon after he was born, like an hour or so. Um, and oh, he's the most beautiful baby in the world. Of course. Oh. <laughs> Every grandmother will say that. Yeah. Yes, but I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You were participating in a service this morning. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, how did you experience this morning's serval service overall? Um, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, sometimes a little uh, incomprehens uh, yeah, incomprehensible. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, my, my Dutch is sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there, there were bits that I missed, um, but I, I loved that all of the people who participated in the, in the service, um, yeah, they brought themselves yeah. and presented, yeah, themselves. Yeah. Just uh, it it um, was an, an, an espe a, especially the the young people the, the younger people I'm so um, the to be so vulnerable in front of a room full of people you don't know, and maybe even harder, people you do know. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I was really touched by that. And then, and the music yeah. was incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Ongelooflijk. 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 Ja. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We want to make a difference in the world mm -hmm. by starting on our, and that's an apostolic uh, way of saying, on our own square meter. Mm -hmm. How can we be relevant on our own square meter? Mm. Yeah, the, um, I think it's Gandhi who says, that we must be the change that we want to see in the world. That um, we, we have to live as, as we believe. Um, that if, if, if what we believe stays in our head, and it doesn't make its way into, not only into our hearts, but into our hands, um, then our belief is irrelevant. Nobody knows what's going on in your head. No. Um, so if you believe in love, the only way anybody else knows about it is that you demonstrate love. And if you believe in peace, the only way anybody else knows about it is that you demonstrate peace. There was 
there's also questions that we received before. Mm. And I would like to give Sebastian the opportunity to ask uh, one of the questions. Sebastian? You decide to participate in this morning service. Why did you come to this conference today? Very practical question, but a relevant one. A practical answer, I was invited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, ab absolutely practical answer. I was invited. You you know, when 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 somebody stretches out a hand yeah. to you, um, you know, the the only way that, that, honestly, the only way that I knew you existed as a community was somebody invited me to participate in something that happens in your community. And so for you, if this community is important to you um, and you have friends who you think would benefit from what your community has to offer, make an invitation. Come see, come yeah. with me. Come, there's something good I have to show you. In in the in the Bible, um, the the disciples, um, Jesus calls the disciples. He's come, and then one disciple tells another disciple, "You know what? Come see what we found. Come." And the next one tells the next one, "Come." You know, it's 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 wonderful to have a, a community of belief, a community of like-minded people, a community of people who are doing something that you feel is good and important, but you kind of need to share it yeah. and share the word that I have found something good, come and see, come and see. And that's building a bridge by inviting somebody else in your community. Mm -hmm. So you were invited. Mm -hmm. And uh, till okay. this moment, does it, 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 does it go okay? Is it okay? To till be now? invited? Yeah, to be here now? Oh yeah. Yeah? yeah okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. This morning the theme was borders and bridges. Yes. And uh, we already talked about it. Yes. Uh, would you share with us what, what was the most difficult bridge you had to cross in your life? Mm. Which day? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think at the at the moment for me the the biggest challenge is learning to speak Dutch. No. Oh, oh God. <laughs> um, it's it, yeah. It's yeah. Um, so in in my mother tongue in Kosa, which most of you can't say. <laughs> um, when you say I don't speak a language or I don't understand a language, you say I don't hear it. You say, and is it, is it Bruno, is it Dutch? So I don't hear Dutch. And um, it is literally what the experience is like of not speaking the language that surrounds you. It is like not hearing what's going on around you, what's, what's being said, what's... And as, as I learn a little bit more of the language, it is like learning to lip read. Um, except that, you know, if you've ever tried to watch someone lip... Um, you know, if you've tried to watch someone's lips to understand what they're saying, they have to be facing you the whole time. So, if a person turns their head, then you can't read what they're saying. And so my Dutch is a little bit like learning to lip read. Sometimes people have their heads turned. I, I, don't, I have no idea what they're saying. No. Um, I am making a guess from the last three words that I understood to the next five words that I didn't understand. But yeah. So learning the Dutch language is important for you? Very. Yeah, and that's also the example you gave us this morning in the service, that in the United States there were people, youngsters and older people, an old lady from China, learning the English language yes. to communicate, mm. building bridges. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is there a border you do not want to cross? 
Hmm. I don't know. I think the that borders and bridges they show up where you don't expect them. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to decide when you get to that border, when you get to that boundary, do I want to go over to the other side? Um, I think as a, um, as a, as a parent, um, one of the jobs that you're constantly engaged in is kind of setting down borders. Yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. Yes, you can come here. No, you can't go there. You know, whatever it is. Yeah. And as a child, very often your job is trying to break down those borders. You said, I can't do this, but... And my friends all can do... Uh, yeah, you know, you know yeah. the whole story. They recognize it. Um, but the... But... but what I, what I find very often with young people is that although they, they test the border, mm -hmm. they test it because they want it to stand. Um, I, you know, I want to, you know, as, a, as a, I remember, um, yeah, I wanted to go to the disco. So th we had discos when I was younger. It was, it was a thing. Um, and I wanted to go to the disco and I asked my dad, can I go to the disco? Because I was the kind of kid who asked. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, no. And I was, how can you say no? I, I asked you, he said, so then why did you ask me? If I couldn't say no, what's the point of asking me? Um, that, that was, he had a, a point. Lesson. That was a lesson. <laughs> that, that was a lesson. But then also when, um, I was working with a group of, of young kids in, in the U.S. and there was one day they were all kind of standing around the table and the one child, one child said a, a swear word. A, what is this? A naughty, nasty word? Yeah, nasty word. And the, one of the other children said, oh, if my mom ever heard me say this, say she would, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so then it went around the table. Each of the children was saying, yeah, if my parents heard me say that, blah, 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 blah. But actually, what each of the children was saying was, I am important enough to my parents that they are willing to put a boundary and do what it takes to make the boundary stick. And that's, you know, so that's the, the, the desire that, that we have for a border that sticks, that, yeah, that it's important, that I'm important enough, yeah. that my parents will take the time to go through all of my, um, is it, is it, what is the, what is whining? Um, uh, complaining. Uh, uh, klagen, yeah, yeah, complaining. All of my klagen. Klagen yeah. And all, you know, like all of that. Yeah. My parents will put up with me doing all of that, yeah. you know, noise making and, ah, and slamming the doors and all of the thing. But Did they you all do that kind of things? Slap me? Yeah? No. <laughs> Angel. <laughs> <laughs> all right, not quite, but yeah, okay. <laughs> you were talking about uh, yeah. your parents, yeah, your yeah. father. Immense, Im yeah, immense important to uh, to realize what are what are borders and where are borders for. Yeah. Um, and some of the youngsters over here, and she's called Leonie Boshuis, has a question mm -hmm. about it. Where is Leonie? Sebas, helemaal achteraan. Thank you. Yes, I found her. Leonie. Um, how was it like to have your father as a father? Because he's uh, pretty famous, he's an uh, inspiration to a lot of people. How was it, um, yeah, how was it like to grow up with your father as a father? Mm. It's, it's a really good question that is almost impossible to answer. Um, he's the only father I ever had. <laughs> 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 so it, um, 
I, you know, I, I look around and I see how um, other fathers are and how other fathers are with their children. Um, I think my father was um, very fair, uh, very loving, but of course also I'm the youngest. So when there's this, I have three um, older, a, a brother and two sisters who are older than me. Um, so they got to, you know, do the test work. Like, okay, yeah. this is this is how you are <laughs> yeah, supposed yeah, yeah. to be as a father or mother or whatever. So by the time they got to me, they were pretty laid back. <laughs> 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 um, so I think, you know, in one way, I, 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 I probably had it easiest of, of all the children. Um, but I think, for the most part, the way you see my father is the way he is. He, he's not one person in front of the camera and another person when he gets home. He's really, yeah, that's him. <laughs> Leonie, good? Yeah. Mooi. Yeah. yeah. So, a father and a mother mm. help you to uh, show you where the borders are and why they are there. Mm. And then you have to make your own decision. Do I cross the border or do I respect the border? Um, which lessons can you draw from that decision-making process? Do I cross the border? Do I make my own borders? To, or do I stick to the border? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think sometimes when you cross the borders that your parents have set and you find out that, oh, that wasn't actually quite a good idea after all, that they had a point there. Um, but sometimes you cross the borders that they set and realize that, yeah, this is the way they lived their lives and the life that I live is different. Um, and there's a, there's a point at which I have to make my own path and my own choices. Um, but, or and, that is the task that, you know, you, you, your parents do the best that they can do. Um, and then it's up to you. And if you, if you choose differently than you have been taught or told, it's fine as long as you're willing to be responsible for the choices that you make. And that's the, that's the place where you get to say, yeah, I'm an adult now. I made this choice. It worked out well. It's my responsibility. It was not so fine. Also my responsibility. Yeah. And now you can practice yourself because at home you both have one daughter at home at the moment, I think. We have uh, one and two halves. <laughs> so we, um, we have uh, Onalena who is who's with us today. And yeah, she's, she's in the escape room now. She escaped from here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's, she's 12 and she's in the escape room. Um, maybe she may have escaped as well yeah. from there. <laughs> um, and then I have a daughter, Nyaniso, who's in um, Cape Town, who's yeah. the mother of my grandson. And then Pina and Julius, who are um, my stepson and stepdaughter, yeah. um, 18 and 16, and they are with us part of the time and with the other mother, other part of the time. And is it, are you able to discuss the way you uh, look at the borders your parents gave to you with your own children, how do you do that? Um, more, 
I talk about the borders I give to them, um, you know, because you know, I carry with me whatever wisdom I manage to yeah. put in my bag from my parents. But I'm not. I'm not living the life my parents no. lived, and my children are not living the life that I live, and so the the borders and the boundaries have to be different. Yeah, and they yeah. are different. And they are different. Yeah. yeah. Sebastian, was daar nog een vraag van de jongeren? What is there a question you have about borders and bridges on that subject to this tutu? Anyone? You can also ask it in Dutch, then I translate it. Yes. If you want some to drink. Please also say your name. Hi, I'm Luke. Hi. And um, did you ever think about leaving your church because of how they view uh, love and marriage? For example, you couldn't um, be a priest and marry your wife. Um, thank you, I think, for the question. <laughs> <laughs> I spared that question for the last 25 minutes. <laughs> it is a question. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it, it's a really good question. And yes, I did. Um, I, I, I did think about it. I thought about um, it feels... Um, It feels hugely inconsistent to me um, to, to say we worship a God of love and in the same breath to say, but we prescribe where love can be. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, there's a, you know, like this, This is love, and this is something else. I don't know what it is. Um, but also, I feel very much that it is the church in which I have grown up. Um, it is the church that has formed me and formed my my thinking um, and that it is a church that is changing um, and that I am willing to be there for the struggle to change the church. Um, I, I, I know and respect the people who, um, who, who cannot stay within a church or within a congregation or within a, a denomination um, that seems so much at, at odds with, well, with itself, really. Um, but I... I I still feel I have work to do there. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. You are a religious woman. Mm. You served as a priest. Mm. Um, I read an interview in a uh, magazine, Het Nieuwe Wij, mm. and in which you indicate that you meet God in the face of another human being. My question is, what do you see when you meet God in the face of another human being? What do you see? In the um, beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, God, God creates um, man and woman, and God creates man and woman in God's own image. Um, and in the Orthodox churches, um, particularly, there is a tradition of praying with icons. Yeah, um, Paintings. Yeah, it's a, it's a, pa it's, it's a painting, 
but it has a very distinct character. So an icon, one thing is that an icon isn't dimensional. It's, okay, it, it's, um, it is specifically, and you, you don't paint an icon, you write an icon. So the, even though the image is an image of a face, or of a person, or of a scene, it's an image of a scene, but you describe that as having written the icon. Um, and it is written, um, you don't pray to an icon, you pray through an icon. So the idea of an icon is that you see through the icon to the face of God. And um, one of the um, famous icon writers would say, if you want an icon, don't go and buy an icon. Walk outside and look at the faces of the people around you and you will see through each face to the face of God. Um, and so what do I see when I look in the face of others? Um, I see the face of God, of God's love and joy and grace and generosity of God's pain and sadness and loneliness. Yeah. Where the, mm, ev well, in, in your tradition, you, you say that we are from the same source. Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, <laughs> in almost every tradition, we say the same thing. That, that we are from the same source, that that, that is God, that the, the, the ground of our being, the, what, 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 what it is that makes us human in the way that, that we are human is that, yeah, we, we are all from God and of God, and that it is in all of us together that you get to see God, not each of us as an individual, but all of us together, that's where you see God. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also this morning you were talking about Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and I thought you were saying it was a philosophy, it's about people and how you look at people. Maybe you can help us. What is Ubuntu in its, in its essence? Because it's not a religion, I think. No. no? What is it? Can you help us? Um, in, in, in Kosa, we say umdung, umdung, abandu. A person is a person through other people. Um, that, that it is um, in our interconnection that our humanity is realized. So that, you know, sort of that, that, I think the, the prophet said, so, the apostle said something like that this morning about yeah. that you're not an, is it an, he didn't say island. He said no, no person is a, but what did he say? Yeah. Can somebody help me? He said something like that. A forgetting, a mistake. Oh, Nobody, it he said, a every, mistake. every person has the right to be there. Nobody yes. is a mistake. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so both nobody is a mistake, but also nobody is, uh, is a, uh, yeah, a thing by itself that, that we're, um, we are interconnected and we are all intentionally part of a whole. Sounds to me like a little bit of religion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Can you ask God questions? Me? You? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. And what happens? Um, and all the time I get answers. Yeah. Um, sometimes the answers aren't what I'd like. No. Um, um, but, oh, actually, Monique, who invited me to be um, part of this, had written, um, Nay is ook an ant boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No is also an answer. It is. Yeah. So, you know, we, um, we hope, we pray, we uh, ask, we throw ourselves into the desire for whatever it is that we desire. Um, and sometimes the answer is no. And that's, yeah, it's an answer. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Going to the next part, and that's about uh, a book called The Book of Forgiving. Mm. You wrote that book together with your father. Mm. Um, the book is especially about forgiveness and reconciliation. Mm. What made both of you starting to write this book? Mm. Um, so my father had written before um, a book called No Future Without Forgiveness, which was a book about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission at the end of the um, apartheid era, where people um, came and told their stories. So they told the stories of what they had suffered under apartheid, or they told the stories of what they had done. Um, and on both sides for the, the, the perpetrators, they stood the opportunity of um, being free to go. And for the, the people who had been harmed, they had the opportunity of hearing the truth about what had happened to them or what had happened to their loved ones. Um, but at the end of, of that Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he had said that unless we are able to forgive, there is no hope for us. There is no hope for a better future for us. Um, and that is true in the smallest of relationships. Um, in the most intimate of relationships. It is also true of our larger world. And so you see war and conflict in one place go becoming the next, you know, sowing the seeds of the next war and the next conflict and on and on and on. And, I, you know, I think you can almost look, say, at Rwanda that after the genocide in, in Rwanda, um, that they decided that we are going to go through a, a truth and reconciliation yeah. process. And now you have a Rwanda that is peaceable and livable, as opposed to a Rwanda that has gone back into another kind of a yeah. civil war. Um, so that was kind of the direction that my father came from into writing the Book of Forgiving. And for me, the direction was that in my preaching, I preached a lot about forgiveness and, um, and talked a lot in, in kind of counseling sessions. Yes, you need to forgive in order to be able to move on. And, and then people would say, yeah, well, and how am I supposed to do that? Yeah. And I'd be like, mm, yeah, right. Good question. Next question. See you next week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Give my greetings to your <laughs> grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and so then we, we sat down and thought about it and talked about it. And, and through the process of, of writing the book, 
um, actually my, the, the, the agreement was supposedly that my dad was going to think and then I would write. Um, but I did a little bit of thinking as well. But he, <laughs> he, um, he drew a picture which is amazing, and it's actually in the book because it's about the only picture that my father has ever drawn, <laughs> and it was a circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it was the, um, the, there's a revenge cycle. You hit me, I experience pain, I hit you. You experience pain, you hit me, and you can over see how that over. we do this over and over again. Yeah. There's an option. You hit me, I experience pain. I say to you, that was painful. I don't want you to do it again, but I'm willing to forgive you and you step out of this infinite circle. And that was the basis of the book, was this amazing work of art. <laughs> it started with a picture. It started with a picture. And it sounds to me like it is a method. Yes. A it method, is a method. To help you to practice forgiveness and reconciliation. Yes. And so. The, the practice and what, what, what we say in the book is that the practice of forgiveness is always the same. It doesn't matter how small or how big the thing that, that you have to forgive is. The practice of forgiveness is first to name the hurt. You hit me or you said something horrible about mm -hmm. me, then to tell the story. So you, you say, um, tell the story, name the hurt. So you, you, know, you said something horrible about me, it made me feel so small or embarrassed or shy, thing, whatever it is, but you um, tell the story, you name the hurt. And at that point, you're willing to, to forgive, but you, you may have to tell the story several times over and before you feel that you're finished with it. Um, there you can offer forgiveness, and then you may reconcile, meaning you may find your way back to each other, or you may decide that it's best to release the relationship, but that the, um, the freedom that, that comes with forgiving is unbelievable, actually, until you've really experienced it. But we do it all the time in, you know, in, in really tiny um, interactions that we, we, we don't necessarily pay attention to what we're doing. We don't sort of name it as a process that we're going through. I mean, you're... Your, um, your five-year-old is playing soccer in the house and knocks over the vase that your grandmother gave you. Yeah. Um, and so you, you'll go through that step. You go through it fast, but you go through it. You know, you're playing soccer in the house. You kicked the, you broke the vase that my grandmother gave me. It's my, you know, it was my favorite vase and it, it really hurt my feelings, but okay, you sweep it up and put, you know, and, and clean up the mess, and you know, I'll, I'll forgive you. I, you're not going to replace the vase. I, I forgive you, and then you can move on to, okay, we can go on together. But you, you don't say, well, you kicked my grandmother's vase, and now... I'm never going to talk to you again and we're done with each other even though you're five years old. <laughs> I sometimes have that, you know? Yeah. But it's, 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 it is what we do. This is, how, this is how we manage to live together as families. So you can say that uh, we had a question this morning. Mm. Uh, the Apostle asked us uh, in the crowd, what comes first, a border or a bridge? And then we had to raise our hands. Uh, 
another question we often ask each other is what comes first, the chicken <laughs> or the egg? Mm -hmm. But you already gave us the answer. What comes first, forgiveness or reconciliation? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, I want to like to ask, to ask the audience mm -hmm. what their opinion is. What comes first? Is it first forgiveness or first reconciliation? We kiest for forgiveness. Do you see hands? I don't see hands. Mm. Higher? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, and who think who thinks that first comes reconciliation? A few? Mm. Yeah, thank you. What do you think? I think forgiveness. I think that in order to reconcile in order, to me reconciliation means deciding for a new basis of relationship. And in order to have a new basis for relationship, you need to have, to be done with the old, to not carry the old relationship forward or the carry the hurt forward into the reconciled space. Although you can have a scarf in your relation. Of course you have a scar. Yeah. Um, a, a scar is, I don't think, I don't think that forgiveness um, is, is uh, something that obliterates the past. Forgiveness says, the past happened, it did. The hurt happened, it did. But the basis of our relationship is not the hurt. The basis of our relationship is that we want to go on together. I have a scar on my, on my leg. Um, I got it from the Mandela's dog. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. No. So um, when I was, when I was a, a, a teenager, we lived in Soweto and half the way up our street was the Mandela's house. And I went to high school with the, with the Mandela, two of Winnie Mandela's daughters. So we'd you know, sort of be up and down the street. Um, but they had a mean, vicious dog whose name was Khrushchev. <laughs> 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 Maybe for the, for the very youngsters, Khrushchev <laughs> is the name of the Minister of Foreign Affairs <laughs> from Russia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he had to do some naughty things. <laughs> so I, yeah, so I, I had gone up to go and visit them and Khrushchev wasn't on his leash and Khrushchev did not take kindly to me. And he saw my leg and he thought lunch. And he <laughs> 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 um, I have a scar, uh, but that, that scar is a story. Mm. It's not anymore the You're central your life. thing about my relationship with those people, or with the dog, for yeah. that matter. <laughs> is he still alive, do you think? I don't think so. <laughs> no. no, no, no. no. Um, please, yeah. Sebastian, met, uh, hiervoor is een vraag. Great. Van hoe de wijving gaat. From Perth. Mm. You met him before, eh? I did. Can you please yeah. state your name? Nice conversation. Can you do, your, can you do your question in English? Uh, yes, I was, I was planning to. <laughs> <laughs> Because in the English language, it's sometimes that forgiveness and forgetting go hand in hand. You need to forgive and forget. What is your outlook on that? Mm. Hate it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I believe very firmly that forgiveness is not a form of forgetting. Um, forgiveness is rather a form of remembering, and it's two kinds of remembering. One, it is to remember who you are, you as a person who is able to forgive, are able to, to claim that 
um, that power and that generosity to be able to say, the person who hurt me tried to define me, but that's not who I am. I am this courageous, beautiful person made in the image and likeness of God, and that is who I, the, the person I claim. And the second kind of remembering is that um, in, in Paul's letters, he talks about us being members of each other, like we're, we are each other's arms and legs, we are part of each other. And the second kind of remembering that, that is forgiveness is that we call each other back. We become members of each other again. In um, one, of the, one of the most moving things that I saw in um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I went to a few of the hearings, but in this particular hearing, there were seven women whose sons had been, um, ha had been set up by the South African police um, and then killed. So they had been set up, they had been given weapons, but then when they went to use the weapons, the weapons all backfired, and so these young people were all killed. And then there was a scene on television of the police dragging these boys' bodies, um, the, their dead bodies, just dragging them to the, um, to the police vans. And the one of the the this group of policemen came to the commission and told the story of said of how they had set up these young boys and the one mother who was kind of the spokesperson for these mothers heard this young man's story. And the first words she said to him were, Mdanam, which means my child. So not, hey, you, not, you know, I want to make as much distance between you and me as I possibly can, but that she, even in that first word, she called him back. She said, my child, I forgive you. But she brought him back into community with her. And I don't know how many of you have, have heard or read the, um, there's a story in the Bible about the prodigal son. Um, and the, the, the prodigal son is this young, young, um, young man who one day goes to his father and says, Dad, I, you know, I want everything you're going to give me when, when you die, and I'm going to go off and go do my own thing. Well, he goes off and he goes, does his own thing and um, runs out of money, ends up coming back home, says, um, says to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm, I'm so sorry, and even if you'll take me back as a servant, I, you know, I'd much rather be here as a servant. And the father says, no, 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 come back, you're my son, I love you, love you, um, and I'm going to throw a party because I'm so thrilled that you're home. And his older brother um, says, this son of yours, not not my brother's back, but this son of yours. I'm putting distance yeah. between me and that guy. You know, that the jealousy that can do this and the forgiveness that does this. Beautiful story. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Are there some? I recognize a young lady. She's called Maike. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. But I want to ask, uh, what if the other one doesn't want your forgiveness? Mm. Yeah. 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 So m my dad says, um, forgiveness is like sunshine. Yeah? So... Well, not so much here in the Netherlands, but in South Africa. <laughs> God gives us the sunshine, the sun shines. It's up to you whether or not you open the curtains and let the sunshine in. The sunshine is there, and it's up to you to receive it, enjoy it, participate in it. The, when you forgive, you have forgiven. It's, this is your offering to the other person. The other person doesn't want your forgiveness, doesn't want it now, doesn't realize what it is. It's still there. Yeah. It's for them to take when they want it, when they, when they can receive it. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes time. This over. Another question. Um, hello, I'm Chantal, hey. and I have a question. How do you teach your children to when, to make the distinction when to build a bridge and when to set a border? Because in Dutch schools there is. Um, there are lessons to learn children not to be bullied or not to bully. But, well, that's all about when, when do I set my border and don't let anyone cross it. But also you want the children to trust each other and not to think uh, the worst. So how do you yeah, teach your children to make that distinction, when to do it, when to trust and when to protect mm. themselves. Um, such easy questions. We get. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to share with the audience that you said to me, don't tell me the questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. don't tell me the questions. <laughs> I want to be surprised. Yeah. And you want to give, I assume that you want to give an authentic, fresh thought or meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed. So this gives you 30 extra seconds to think about the Thank question. You. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there isn't a one size fits all no. teaching. You really, um, it, it is living with the questions that come up in your life. Um, the, yeah, the discussions about bullying and being bullied, they're not only at school, they come home with the children. Mm -hmm. And with your children, you know, you, you do have to say, yeah, this is permissible, this not. And it happens even at home. The children try to bully us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and even at home, the, 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 the borders and boundary setting, they have to do, but we have to do as well. And in all honesty, our children learn much more from what they see than from what we say. Um, and so if you want your children to have healthy borders, then you practice healthy borders with your children. Um, if you want them to have 
relationships that are um, loving and trusting, then you show them loving and trusting relationships. And that's, yeah, it's the best you can do. And then the circle is around practice, yeah. what you preach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it can be difficult and maybe, I do not know, maybe she is a mother yeah. and I'm a father and yeah. it's difficult to raise your children because maybe you said it also, I won't do the same things as my parents did. And then somebody else is telling you, you're acting like your mother. <laughs> yeah, you recognize that, and me too. Mm -hmm. um, some small things about forgiveness and reconciliation. Mm. You help us with giving us a method, mm. a way of uh, doing forgiveness and come to reconciliation. Mm. But how do you start when you do not have enough energy or power to start the method? Mm. You don't want to stay, you don't want to, to stuck mm. into the mess. Mm. Can you help us how to start? What helps? That's, I, yeah, I think that that's already the start. The start is wanting to start. It's, you know, it's always, there's, there's a, a, a moment before you even want to forgive when you're so stuck in the whatever it is that you're stuck in. Um, when you're so angry or so hurt and that's where you're dwelling and you don't want to, you're not interested in finding a bridge anywhere. Um, and then there's the next moment where you, yeah, I want to be able to forgive this person. I don't have it in me yet, but maybe there's a moment that will come when I have moved from no to maybe, and then from maybe to yes. Mm. Mm. Where comes God in this process? Everywhere. <laughs> um, in the in the book of forgiving, um, they, I, there are a lot of poems um, or prayers or whatever. Those those were all um, they were all my conversations. The small conversations I was having with God as I was. You know, as, as I was, yeah, I prayed my way through them. That's, that was how, that was how the poems came was they were, yeah, this was the conversation I was having with God and how, how do I hear God? Yeah. That is how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. We come to an end uh, of our conversation. We already used more than 50 minutes and Twan House is only using 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think a lot of us have the opportunity to ask you a question in our lifetime. Okay. So this is your last chance. Who wants to ask another question? Oh, Luke. Okay, <laughs> Sebas. Hello, my name Hi. is Miriam and I was wondering if you ever experience any cultural or perhaps religious differences between you and your wife and how do you handle, how do you both handle? <laughs> <laughs> Marcelina, let's go to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> cultural differences. Yeah, she has a whole, yeah, my wife has a whole long list of cultural differences. Ah. Um, we will we'll outset those on, on this side. Religious differences, well, my wife is an atheist, which makes life very interesting. Um, no. <laughs> there are, I, for Marceline maybe to know, there are other atheist uh, apostolic too, so yeah. you, there's another one, but there are yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 
but there's a, yeah, the, um, there's a, an, an ethical sense in, in, in my wife that makes our life together possible. And there is a mutual respect that also makes our life together possible. So yeah. But we're, yeah, she's, we're getting her. She's beginning to get her South African on. <laughs> 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 Marcelina said, we talked about that the way back. <laughs> yeah. I saw some other hands, yeah. maybe some other questions. Sebas. Hey. To forgive is a very uh, difficult uh, sometimes. So what was for you the most difficult moment to forgive somebody else? Maybe after the apartheid? It was a very difficult time, I think so. And um, yeah, what was the most difficult uh, yeah, moment for you to do, to forgive somebody? Ooh, um, I I don't a hundred percent know. I think every moment of forgiving is feels impossible until you climb over it. And then, it, yeah, it's the hardest thing you've done until you've done it. Um, and uh, yeah. I think that things like apartheid, which are global and don't feel personal, don't feel as hard to forgive, honestly. I think the things that feel hardest to forgive are the things that feel personal. Um, the things that feel and it's, and it's the people who are closest to you who, um, who get under your skin in a way. Um, and the, the thing that feels really challenging about forgiving the person or the people who you love is that you feel like you should have known better, mm -hmm. you know, or you should know me enough to know the damage that that was going to do to me. And the reality is that the people who we love have exactly the same experience of us, they think, how could you say da-da-da when you know that that hits me? Yeah. So, yeah, what is the hardest? Yeah. The personal things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I saw two, two other hands I in the air. Put your hands in the air. There. Oh, two over there. Over there. <laughs> thank you. My name is Lorena. I just want to thank you for writing that book because I think it has helped a lot of people. Oh. You know, that was the last piece of the puzzle for a lot of us. Oh. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Florian. Uh, I really like your story about the eight-year-old girl who thought you were sisters. Yes. It reminded me of a story of, I think, eight-year-old boys, a darker-skinned one and a light-skinned one, um, who got the same haircut so their teacher wouldn't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> um, and I think children have some sort of a childly blindness for those things. Um, but it seems as we grow older, we lose that, and, which is a shame. So I was wondering, what is your view on that? Is there any way we could retain it. Mm. We all, 
as as we get older, we develop like a visual shorthand. So you know, our shorthand is um, that is a man. He must blah, 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 whatever. There's a kind of little list checklist that we have in our minds, and that is a woman, and she must blah, 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 and that is a kind of short list that we have in our minds. And in a way, it is helpful um, if we weren't able to see, you know, that is a stove, the stove is red, it is hot, do not put your hands there. This would not, you know, this is a, a kind of a visual shorthand that we need and that is useful to us. But it's a visual shorthand that is not always useful to us and that we sometimes need to learn to check it. So I don't think that it is necessary to throw the shorthand away. Um, but I do think that it is necessary to periodically check our assumptions. The, what am I assuming about this person who is standing opposite me? And how do I check that assumption? Um, you know, I, um, I walk onto a plane and the, on, on KLM, all the flight attendants, dach mefro, dach mefro, dach mefro, hello. <laughs> um, but, how do they know? <laughs> um, maybe I could answer Dachmafro as well. Um, but it's a shorthand that they have developed that yeah. you know this is this is how this is how I do it mm -hmm. to make this person feel welcome. But it can also be a way of throwing somebody out. Yeah. That you know, making making somebody feel thrown out. And so there's, yeah, there's a, a need to be constant in, in just check, check our assumptions, check our shorthand. And especially when our mental shorthand um, is making the, the person opposite us into a bad person or a less than person, then, then it's a good time to check. Thank you. Mm. There's a last question I see. Oh, yes. Two. Hi, I'm uh, Rosemary. And uh, what I noticed in the Netherlands is that there are a lot of um, stereotypical views uh, of Africa and Africa, African cultures. And I uh, ask you, like, do you notice? And what do you do then? What, well, how do you handle that? Do you defend your culture always? or? Do you stop like the, uh, the, the conversation? Um, I I have lived in enough places in the world that aren't Africa um, to c come to an understanding that um, I sometimes get to be the representative African. Um, and I decide whether or not I want to be the representative African in that moment. Mm. Um, so, you know, <laughs> but because, you know, you get the, you, you, sometimes you get this, well, you're from Africa, what do Africans think about? Like, the whole continent? Right, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm the whole, all African representative council is me. Um, yeah, so it's uh, um, it, not so much here, uh, not so much in the Netherlands, particularly because people seem to, at least in, in the area that I'm in, people seem to be much more widely traveled. Um, but yeah, certainly in the US, I, I got that a lot. Yeah, but then it's, it really is a matter of deciding, am I going to take on the ambassadorship or am I going to, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
I saw a question over there, Sebas. Yeah. Another last question? <laughs> I've got the last one. I was quite touched. Uh, my name is Bright Richards, and I was quite touched this morning when you explained the story about how you help these migrants in America, uh, especially the, the refugees, to build bridges to their new society. So uh, I would just want to find out that there some examples about also how you helped um, the indigenous uh, inhabitants, for example, like America to also build bridges with mm -hmm. the new people in their community. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, yeah, the, well, it was, I, I guess, two of the easier things. One um, was working in that ESL program, um, English as a Second Language program, and that, that it was, um, uh, that, that there were, uh, there were Americans who worked alongside me um, teaching English as a second language and helping people to build bridges into the American community. Um, also that for five years I ran a scholarship program for refugees um, and in that scholarship program would work alongside the refugees and also alongside the, the receiving communities, so the receiving university communities um, to provide support to the refugees, but also to su provide support to the communities and uh, orienting them, and this, you know, sort of how do you understand how to work with the people who are coming in? What are the expectations? So for instance, um, in one community in New Hampshire, um, the, the, the community had been incredibly welcoming of one young woman um, and her two children. And they had given her all, you know, they they'd brought blankets and furniture and food and so on and so on. And, you know, she had, not been effusive in her thanks, and they were like, oh, okay. Um, and then she held a, a kind of a potluck um, a dinner, but yeah. you know, bring and share yeah. kind of dinner for the people who had helped her, and um, asked one of the members from our staff to come and the member from our staff said um, to, to the people who had helped her to integrate that in our culture, when you are overwhelmed by generosity, um, you don't say thank you because you do not have enough mouths to say the thanks that you need to say and so I offer this thanks on behalf of my sister um, because you have been so warm and generous to her. But, yeah. Beautiful. A wise lesson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I asked you, did you ever saw a college tour and you saw one of the series? Yeah. I know which one. Um, and there's always a last question. And the last question is, what is the best advice that you can give to the young people present here? What is the best advice that you can give to the young people and some older mm. present here? Mm. Yeah, so remember, Remember who you are, that you are this one piece of perfect in, of perfection in the imagination of God. That when God imagined 
a perfect humanity, it would not be without you. That when God imagined a perfect world, it would not be without you. And so, when you go out of this place, go out to be the blessing that you were created to be. Thank you, Mapo Tutu. Charlotte, want we later we won't leave you with uh, empty hands. Charlotte, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's also something we do in the Netherlands. Say it with flowers. Thank you. Get a big hug and we gave you a book from Frank van Ham who lived for several years in Soweto together with young men helping them with making art and he's making this book Ubuntu. Thank you. <laughs> Look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's with all good things they come to an end. I want to thank you again and your wife for sharing us here. Thank you everybody for participating and being together in this one hour and a half with Miss Tutu. Hope to see you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. We now invite you all to go to the hall next door for the final session of the conference. Thank you very much. That way. Uh